have my prom dress from 1980. We will never pass this way again. And my ugly Christmas sweater from the 1990s, back when they were just called Christmas sweaters. And I never met a vintage clothing or resale shop I didn't love and try to find something to bring home. I brought home vintage outfits from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and I'm always trying to figure out when I can wear them. This is a problem I'm actively solving with every episode of Living Figuratively, though. Sure, I have tons of vintage stuff piled up around here, but I can't help but wonder why you gave it all away. Welcome. Welcome to the 42nd episode of Living Figuratively with your host, moi, Judy Takis. Uh, this is the show that asks the question, why not fill your home with the fascinating faces and figures of people that you don't even know? Why not fill your home with figurative art? Each week, I bring you to a different area of my house or my studio, or sometimes out, but today we're here, um, to show you figurative art and show you ways that you can learn to connect with it, love it, and want to potentially live with it. Tonight, we're taking a very short walk to my closet. But before we do anything, I'm gonna take off these god-awful, uncomfortable, Milano, Christian, Leblonic shoes with my fake red heels on them because unlike Carrie Bradshaw, I'm all about comfortable shoes. Okay, so short walk on the way to my closet where I'm gonna show you some of the uh, outfits that I've worn for living figuratively over the past 42 episodes, if you can believe it. Um, but on the way there, we have, you guessed it, figurative art. So in this little skinny hallway leading to my closet, I have put some of my vintage art pieces that I painted back in art school, back in the 1980s. So um, this was from a time where I was addicted to life drawing. At Cleveland Institute of Art, where I went, we I always signed up for a life drawing course every single semester, all five years. Um, but one of the good things was they had life drawing courses going on for, I think, just about every day of the week. So I was able to pop into other people's life drawing courses too. And, you know, so like I ended up with one to two days of life drawing every single, every single semester, and it was really good. One of the things you keep seeing is the same models over and over and over again. So, as it's because it's like there's only so many human poses and we had a finite number of models, one of the things that I did was I set up these compositions where I would paint other kids in the classroom like we'd all be in a circle. So, I could see across and there I painted another kid in the classroom. He had headphones on back then, he headphones were, were a little bit bigger. Um, and I would set up compositions because a lot of times we had two models, which was really nice. So like you could do these compositions with, with two models and not just one. And um, I did these with the new discovery because I had done a uh, summer internship at um, American Greetings where I learned about the wonders of Luma dyes. Here, I'm gonna show you right here what a Luma dye actually is. It's a liquid watercolor that comes in a little bottle with an eyedropper. Um, this one is actually 35 years old. It's from that time period. And we used to use them in airbrushes, but they were also fabulous watercolor things that you could do and I would put them into my little ceramic watercolor palette here without having to mix colors because when you're in a life drawing class, everything's very fast paced and it's like gestures and stuff like that. And a lot of times you've only got 15 or 20 minutes, if that, sometimes only 10 or five minutes to do your, um, to do your drawing. So one of the things I loved about these drawings um, is the, the, the confidence that I had back then, and maybe it was confidence of ignorance or confidence of just, I'm doing so much life drawing that I might as well just, you know, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try that, because freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Um, and I used a lot of, quote, good paper. 
because back at the, during the art school days, you were real, I was real scared about using good paper because, you know, what if you screwed up? But as you start getting better and better, what if you do a good drawing and it's on the bad paper that's gonna, you know, fall apart? Like if you put it on newsprint and it's gonna fall apart in 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so I started using the good paper and then as I got more comfortable with it, I kept using the good paper and I'm really happy with it because these drawings are 35 years old and they're as good as they ever were. You know, they're not, you know, whatever, messed up or, or cracking or anything like that. The one thing that I do want to change on this is the framing of it. Um, these frames are from the 1980s and that's when I framed them. So someday, hopefully sooner than later, I'm going to take all three of them to Susie Porges, um, studio who is my wonderful framer and we'll frame these up right and I'll put them back up here. The other thing that I discovered is I've got a nice blank spot right here so I have room for one more so I got to go digging through my old art school files and see if I can find one more piece there. So short walk, a lot of stuff. This next thing right here I want to call your attention to a absolutely fabulous architectural salvage mirror that I found at, um, it was actually at a store in Chagrin Falls, Ohio called uh, White Magnolia. And it's still, the store is still there. I bought this about 10 years ago, but it, I'm thinking it was a built-in piece in somebody's old home that they either renovated or their home got torn down. So their loss is my gain because I just love this. And I love that there's a little stand here for a teapot. It looks like you could open it, but you can't unless it's sealed shut and there's like a magical frog in there or something. Um, but I love this mirror. It's absolutely perfect in this hallway closet. And it's exactly opposite from this little cabinet here, which this little cabinet is my jewelry slash skinny things that I can fit into a cabinet. It's also the place where I pick out my Kim Mati earrings, which incidentally I don't have on, so I'm gonna put on a pair of them right now. I keep all these little compartment uh, boxes in here for different earrings and I organize them in different themes that don't make sense to anybody but me. Um, but, so that's this. And this corner, I, want to show you is highlighted the the gem of the hallway is my beautiful Teresa Ohaka drawing I think I showed this to you all sort of in the early days of COVID because Teresa Ohaka who is a fabulous figurative artist she paints these very dynamic colorful amazing paintings in fact you know what I have one of her paintings on my leggings today this is uh I believe it's crying baby um, she puts her paintings onto leggings and also scarves and all of those are available on her website, which there's a link to it on my website. So if you're interested, go hunt her down. Um, Teresa, during the early days of COVID started doing a thing where at three o'clock every day, she would put out a ballpoint pen drawing that she had done or like an ink, ink drawing that she had done in her sketchbook and put it up for sale at a super, super reasonable price, which you really want to jump on that. So like I would actually set my um, alarm every day for 2.58 so that it would ring and I could rush to Facebook and wait for her to post the drawing. This one I lucked out because she didn't post it right at three o'clock. She took a little while, took a little while. It somehow didn't, but I kept checking back, kept checking back. And as soon as she posted it, I was like, that's me. And I, you know, put in the comments, can it be mine? And sure enough. So, and then of course I took it to Susie Porges studio. She framed it up with this beautiful, the, the frame has a little bit of a sort of a rustic charm to it, but it's not too, you know, farmhouse because this isn't a farmhouse kind of a thing, but it does have that age, aged patina to it that really makes her drawing absolutely beautiful. And I believe if I'm not mistaken she's teaching an online um, drawing course this weekend so check that all out sign up for it um, she's awesome now we come to the closet which is the place where you guys are all you know interested in seeing so for living figuratively 
One of the things that I do each week, I try to do my little, you know, 1960s, 1970s TV show theme. And today I actually jumped ahead to the 1990s and did a little Carrie Bradshaw from Sex and the City. I'm going to just give it away because she has this legendary, amazing closet. You know, my closet is not Carrie Bradshaw amazing, but it's a walk-in closet and I'm, you know, pretty happy with it. Of course, closets can always be bigger. But one of the things that I use and wear for living figuratively are my vintage dresses. And... I'm a big one for collecting these vintage dresses. When I find one that looks kind of cute on me, that's just kind of right, that fits right, I'll get it and look for excuses to wear it. And living figuratively has given me all kinds of excuses, excuses to wear it, which I'm thrilled about. This one right here is the one that I wore for That Girl, the That Girl episode where I had the umbrella and I was dancing down the street um, for the Group 10 Gallery show in Kent. That was over the summer. This one right here I wore as Ju Judy, the cruise director for the Love Boat episode, the Love Desk. And this may make an appearance again in some official capacity because it does kind of feel like a stewardess sort of an outfit. So like if there's an opportunity to, you know, play a stewardess somewhere, that's what I will do. Um, this one right here I wore as Aunt Kate for the uh, Petticoat Junction episode where I came down the stairs. And um, one of the things, all three of these, I got at this phenomenal store in Ann Arbor called Get Up Vintage. In fact, I've got one of their stickers right here. This is, if you recognize that little sticker, that's the Get Up Vintage store in uh, Ann Arbor. And um, one of the reasons why I love these 1960s vintage dresses is because they're short. I'm short. And they are just kind of like they hit the right height. If I had like super long, long legs, they might be just too short. And if I was like really short, then they might be too long. But they just hit the right height for me. So I really, really, I like them. I like the way they look. And now I've got excuses to wear them. Um, this one right here is a little bit different. I think this is from the 1930s or the 1940s. I'm not actually positive. This was the dress that I wore for the Dorothy episode, the Thanksgiving episode. And um, the reason that I got it, I got this in a, a vintage store in Cincinnati called Mannequin, I believe. I looked it up. It, this was years ago. Um, the reason I got it is because I love the big collar. I love the fact that it had these slanted pockets. It also has a high-low hem to it. Now, that high-low hem is not a 1940s, 1930s thing. The high-low hem was what happened when I have my secret ace in the hole for buying vintage outfits. One of the things that I've discovered and now can't live without is a tailor. Um, and right here in my hometown, I have a wonderful tailor called Helena from A&M Tailors right here in Solon. But I'm sure wherever you're watching, you have a tailor in your hometown too. What a tailor can do is you get a vintage outfit that's maybe just a little, the tiniest bit big, and they can make it fit you perfectly. They can take it in where you want it. They can shorten it. They can do a high-low hem if you want to, like, you know, modernize it up a little bit. They can take in the puckers because sometimes... You have sleeves that kind of are a little bit bulbous and you can see your bra strap in there. They can take that in and make that disappear like magic. It is the best friend of vintage clothing shopping is a tailor. And most vintage clothes, unless you go to the, like the super upscale stores where they have the, you know, the really expensive, you know, Chanel stuff and everything. Most vintage clothes that you buy are cheaper than new clothes. So that added to the what the tailor charges it works out to be oftentimes less than what you would pay for a new outfit and or maybe the same. But it also, it does this wonderful thing like where you're not, you're, the money that you're buying, that you're paying is staying in your community. You're buying it from a local vintage shop. So it's going to a local business proprietor. Um, then you're taking it to your local tailor. So the money that you're spending there is going to your local into your local community. Um, it's not funding, you know, child labor in other countries. 
And it's also part of that reduce, reuse, recycle threesome where you're reusing something instead of creating a new thing using the new resources. It's really just a very healthy, good thing for the environment. And you get cute outfits that nobody else has. And if you do your own TV show, you can wear them whenever you want, or you can wear them wherever you want anyway. So that's why I'm a huge proponent of vintage shopping. I've got um, one of the, the, uh, the, the other things, like a lot of the hats that I've worn in um, For Living Figuratively. Here's my Mary Tyler Moore hat, which may someday be a rerun from What's Happening hat because it's the same kind of thing uh, if, I ever, if I ever play rerun. Uh, here's my Aunt B hat, which I, both of these I got at my favorite vintage store in our area in Cleveland, which is Sweet Lorraine. Um, on the Cleveland's West Side. And they have an amazing selection of stuff. It's, you have to be prepared because it's, there's a lot of stuff in a little space. But that's the joy of it, is that you have so, so, so much selection. And um, it, like that's where I got my Zsa, Zsa Gabor, my Zsa, Zsa Gabor outfit, which, you know, is like, a, oh, it's a peignoir, I think is what it's called, where it's a little jacket, and that's the kind of thing that Zsa, Zsa Gabor wore all the time. Um, it is also, actually, I think I got this one at Get Up Vintage. This was my Jan Brady, Jan Brady outfit, which at the time, you know, is very polyester and, you know, very 1970s. And at the time, I had no idea what I was ever going to wear for. I didn't know if I was even going to wear it in public. But when it came time to play Jan Brady, this one, this one was perfect. Now, as far as the piece, the clothing that I've kept from my own past. This little dress here now is about 20 years old, if you can believe it. Um, and I wore this for the Pam Redo episode because this is Pam's favorite dress of mine. And it harkens back to our days when we went on our Chicago girls trip. And we can both still fit in the dress, which is really, really good. Um, this right here, I talked about my ugly Christmas sweater, which is, you know, back from the days when it was just a Christmas sweater. Um, this is the one I wore for the uh, Island of the Misfit Toys Rebellion episode. And uh, it's ugly as ever. It's got words. It's got everything. And I decided to keep it. And, of course, we have Lieutenant Uhura, the Lieutenant Uhura outfit, which I wore last week. And um, I love any opportunity to wear it, but I had to wear it with leggings because... It's got this gigantic split and, you know, it's really kind of not a dress because I guess all the ladies on, the, you know, the Star Trek had to wear little mini dresses. The guys got to wear, you know, the pants and everything, but the ladies all had to wear the mini dresses. But anyway, I was glad to have an opportunity to wear my Lieutenant O'Hara shirt. Um, and let's go back to my 1980s prom dress, which I have kept all these years. And my 1980s prom dress, you know, with spaghetti straps back when that was all the rage, um, became my Lily Monster, my Lily Monster dress, which it was, I, you know, Lily Monster in the actual show, that was from a Halloween episode. In the actual show, she wears a shroud cape, so it's kind of like the, it looks like the lining of a, of a coffin, um, as her cape. And of course I don't have that and I couldn't find it and whatever. So I had to use my 1980s prom dress, but I added to it to give just a little bit of a bada bing, this bolero, which I'm wearing right now, which I got from Marcel Moda online. Um, it's the best thing ever. I have a couple of these because I've actually lost them. And so hopefully somebody else found them and they're enjoying them. They are fabulous for people that kind of get cold like me. So I like to keep this with me on a summer night where, you know, in the early evening you can wear your sleeveless dresses and stuff, but later it, you know, gets a little cold. You have this tiny thing. You can just ball it up in the tiniest ball in your purse. You can tie it to your purse and put it on. So I wore that with my, um, with my Lily Munster outfit. And of course, the wig. I do have several wigs. I don't have to pull them all out for you, but the Lily Munster wig um, also added to the uh, the whole aura of the, you know, the Lily Munster outfit. Um, and so that right now, I believe, 
is it for my closet expose. I've got a lot of other outfits, but maybe I'll do another outfit episode at some point. Um, in the meantime, thank you so much for joining me for Living Figuratively tonight. And next week, we will go back out on the road. We're going to Waterloo, which is an area of Cleveland. It's an artsy area of Cleveland. Believe it or not, Cleveland has so many little pockets of artsy areas, and Waterloo is one of them. We're going to the New Beginnings show, which is curated by Davon Brantley, who we met, you know, last month this time. And um, it's a fabulous show. I've only seen pictures of it online, but I'm going to go visit this weekend and hopefully um, make you guys want to go visit it too after our show next weekend. So join me next week. Same bat time, same bat channel, January 21st. 2021, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And y'all come back now, you hear?